Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into the Profitable Musician Show. Hey everyone, welcome to the podcast. I am Bree Noble and I'm excited to be here today with Eric Farber from Creators Legal. Oh, this is a, a really important topic, I think, and something that is definitely neglected by indie artists until it turns out that we kind of need to pay attention to it. So we'll talk about that in a minute, but I want him to give a little background on himself, his experience as a lawyer, and now this new Creators Legal that he recently started. So just give us your background, Eric. Wow. Well, um, I was a sports and entertainment lawyer for over 20 years, representing all sorts of different um, entities and uh, athletes and entertainers and filmmakers and musicians and um, artists, authors, just about whatever you can think of. And I did a lot of work in the music business, mostly in the rap world, um, where I represented the Tupac Shakur State for 18 years, among a lot of other kind of big names in the, in the entertainment space. Very cool. So what, what made you decide to start this new venture? And I love like the, I love looking at these like catchphrase descriptors because I think it really helps you understand, like encapsulate what it is. I know it's been called like the legal zoom of the entertainment industry. It's been called, what was the other thing that someone said? Uh, variety, daily variety called us an entertainment lawyer in a box. That's right. I loved that. Um, so do you feel like those are good descriptions of what you guys do? Yeah, actually, I do. I think it's a, you know, we, we like to say one click contracts for creators, but um, an entertainment lawyer in a box, I think is pretty accurate. Cool. So what kinds of things do you guys offer with this service and, and kind of how does it work? And then we'll get into why you created it. But I kind of want to give people an idea of like what exactly it is first. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty simple stuff. You know, uh, we we are a do it yourself you know, online service is the best way to put it. It's a website and uh, we are contracts for creators and all sorts of creators, whether you're an indie filmmaker, musician, author, you're in live theater, web series, podcasters, et cetera. Um, we, we've got more than a hundred contracts. It's probably about 120 contracts and we're set up either as, you know, purchase a, a, a single contract or you, for more prolific uh, creators, a, um, a subscription. And we actually have a really simple to use form builder that helps people actually build the contracts, which take on average, we've timed them right less than six minutes to do each one. Wow. And then a, a full digital briefcase, which we call a project briefcase, where people can actually store the stuff, um, store all of the different contracts for all the different projects that they're uh, that they're working on. Plus, we're, we're all digitized. Uh, you know, we we are um, we're more modern than some of the other um, systems around, especially lawyers. And uh, so, once you build the contracts, you can actually get it signed. Uh, you know, send it to the other person through email and. Get get it signed right there and everything's kept in one spot. So instead of using something like DocuSign, you've got that kind of all built into your service, which I think is really Completely. smart. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So they get an email on their phone, they click it open, they can sign it and it's done. I think that's so key for like situations where you just end up in a room with people and you start writing a song, right? You want to be able to have that be so simple and not have to worry about figuring out how to contact the people later. Just get it done. Yeah, actually, the idea came from a good friend of mine is a guy named Ron Welty, who was the drummer of The Offspring for 16 years. You know, the, um, I think they actually have a claim to fame of the highest selling indie 
indie band of all time and that's exactly what he said you know he has the studio at his house and he's like i you know i never get anything signed because you know people come over and then by the time we know we've just cut a song and we didn't realize you know that this was going to happen right so that that actually came from him like hey what if we're all sitting in a room and uh and i said well you you know jump on and get it done I love that. Yeah, it's definitely, I've heard more than many uh, stories about that happening. And then people later, like getting potential sync offerings and stuff like that, and not even know how to track down the people, you know, to get their approval. Yeah, it happens. And um, I actually have, I can't, you know, say all the stories, but in rap world, right, this was really common, especially through the 90s they'd have 10 people working on a song and then they'd go out and they'd take clips of other people's songs. And, um, that sampling is, you know, people think, Oh, it's just a little tiny bit. Well, there's no such thing as a little tiny bit of sampling. You either sampled it or you didn't. And if you took something else, you, you gotta get a license for it. Right. And today they, you know, there's a lot of the beats, right? Um, uh, people are, are licensing beats all the time and, and digital creators are creating beats and selling these things all the time. And you've got to have those, you've got to have those things. You never know when a, when a song is going to blow up or when a, you know, especially in today's world, you know, you never know when an indie, when an indie song could really take off. And if you end up getting a publisher, if you end up getting, you know, a more traditional distributor, you've got to have these things or they won't take the songs. Yeah, absolutely. So in your experience being in uh, an entertainment lawyer, like what were kind of the things that you saw happening for people or the pain points that made you want to create this service to, to help people so they didn't get into these situations where like legal was kind of basically an afterthought until like they really needed it well i saw so many situations that happen and usually it was people would come and say i'm being sued or i've got to sue somebody right because i did a collaboration on a song and the song did really well and now nobody will pay me well where's your contract well we didn't have one and what i saw a lot of times was you know especially in the indie world, there's not a lot of money flying around to create stuff. And so they, they're they just avoiding lawyers because lawyers can just be such an expensive endeavor. So they don't bother, right? And a lot of these contracts are super simple. Um, I always say lawyers over lawyer, right? hmm. they make things more complicated than they need to be. And for the most part, entertainment contracts and music contracts and film, they're, they're just templates. And so all we really did was give the access, as we call it, the access to justice, right? For for the for the people who need this stuff kind of the most, that are the most prolific creators. And most of these creators aren't making a ton of money. So we wanted to create something that was really accessible for people. I love that. And yeah, so what is the what's the subscription model look like? I'm just curious, like how prolific do you need to be to make that worth it versus just doing one offs? It's much less. In fact, we are about to set up a code for your listeners Ooh. You can get Bree 75. They can put that in and they will. And it, I think it's less than a hundred dollars a year. Oh, my gosh. For all the contracts you want. That's amazing. By the way, my name is spelled B-R-E-E, Bree75. You guys go use that. That's amazing. Yeah. Because that is that's that's like nothing. I mean, I've looked at contract websites where it's like $40 per contract. So if you've used two or three of them, you're done. You know, that's it, yeah. right? And there's all kinds of things that come up. So what are the What are kind of all of the use cases for the different, you said you've got like a hundred different kinds of contracts. So give people some ideas of like, where would they be or what would they be doing or what might come up that would make them need a contract? Well, I'm going to speak more specifically towards music because this is, you know, this is about music. So we have like an indie music package that has an artist management that has um, a single song collab contract, which is basically a couple of people working together on a song. And it lets you, it lets those two artists work things out in advance, right? 
mm-hmm. um, to collaborate. We have sync licenses. We have mechanical. Um, we have mechanical rights licenses, and then to hire the people that are working on the songs with you. So like a side artist recording agreement, a featured artist recording agreement. So if you're bringing people in, you know, on those songs, because you know, in the more um, I won't even say traditional because I think indie is a very traditional part of music now. It goes back for you know decades, right? It's more about individual songs than it is about albums these days. And so we've created these things that are about individual songs and getting things done on an individual song basis. But we have master use licenses, beats licenses. So if you're a beat artist, you can come in here because people are going to be buying and licensing your beats and um, making sure that each time you sell one, that you've got the right contract in place. So, so like, the, if you're not going through one of those, you know, web like Beat Stars or one of those websites, if you were selling them directly on your your own website, you would have the ability to have the right contract for that. Yeah, as well as the making sure that you've got. What, what happens a lot of times is it's not necessarily just going through somebody else's way, you know, going through your website, so to speak. It's stuff is happening person to person. Mm. And that's happening probably more than it is in just going and buying a beat, you know, for, for people. Because one of the things that I've always loved about the music community is it is a community. And so people are working on stuff together and they're collaborating together on a regular basis. And so we wanted to create contracts that were really about those collaborations. Totally. And so what about like situations where you've got like side musicians, you know, you bring in someone to play a a guitar part on a song or a backup singer, or even like if you're a songwriter and you bring someone in to be the singer on your song, but their work for hire, do you have contracts for all of that? Yeah, we're work for hire. All of our contracts are work for hire when it has anything to do with collab and the ability to do royalty splits within the contracts as well. Oh, cool. So if there's a situation where you actually want to offer them a percentage of the royalties, you can do that with the contract? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Or you can say like, no, you're just a work for hire. You don't get any access to royalties on the master or anything. Correct. Yeah. What about things for working with the studio as far as them not having any rights to your masters. If you're working with a studio, you mean the recording studio themselves? Right. Yeah, they're going to have a contract for you. So we stayed away from the contracts that are, these are sort of musician-centered contracts. You're the you're the artist producer. and um, But if you go into a studio, they're going to hand you a, a contract that is 90%. Okay, I will be honest that I did not have a contract when I had my first studio experience. They did not hand me anything. <laughs> really? Uh, That's really interesting. Yep. Um, yeah. But um, we don't have a studio contract in there, but I'm going to write that down because my experiences have always been that that it's uh, they're going to hand you a contract. Well, if you if you say you're working with someone that has this was not the case. This was an actual studio in Orange County, but like let's just say that it's someone who has a studio in their garage or their basement or whatever, they might not have a contract, right? And I think as musicians, right. we should be prepared for that just to make sure that they don't try to make any claim on our masters. Yeah, there's no question and uh, I'm just taking that note because <laughs> uh, we will go ahead and and do one. One of the things that's beautiful about this system that we've created and we're doing a lot of talking to people um, about use case scenarios because we have so many different segments of the entertainment business and the entertainment business is just so broad these days, right? Like um, I spoke yesterday with a woman who, um, or a couple of days ago with a woman who is a digital creator and she has a fashion brand. She has a, um, she has a skincare line and she's a writer and, and she has a podcast. And so there's different, there's these different things that we don't even think about sometimes as when we're iterating and coming up with the new stuff, we've, we've really been looking at the traditional side and then people contact and contact us all the time and say, Hey, what about this? And it's like, we didn't even think of that. And we've been doing this for years. And so like, I didn't think about that use case. It takes us a few days to put something together and then actually just get it onto the site. Cool. Yeah. Well, so I really encourage anybody who uses our system. One is it's still early. 
you know, we've only been launched for about three months. Um, we've gotten a lot of subscribers already and a lot of users and they'll reach out to us and we love it when they reach out and say, Hey, what about this? You know, have you thought of that? And then we're, you know, we're busy like little bees in the back, you know, in the back room trying to, you know, make more. If they're working with a contractor about something that's not about a song, like they're creating album art or they're, they're working oh, for that yeah. project. Um, we, we don't have full album art um, stuff, but we do have graphics. We have like, it's really similar to the self-publishing that we've got where people are working on that. And we do have that in line coming on album art and things like that. It may be in there already. Um, but okay. yes, absolutely. The graphics and then social media managers, et cetera, mm -hmm. for, for your online presence. We're, yeah, we're trying I'm to just, think of all these people as good as digital creators. Right. Yeah. I'm just thinking of anyone that a musician would need to bring on board. I mean, if you're hiring, say a PR agency or something, they should have their own contracts, but if mm -hmm. you're just like pulling someone, you know, uh, like some friend that you have or whatever, that's going to work for you in a certain way um, or on a limited basis. I think it's always good to have a contract, right? So everybody knows what everybody's responsibility is and, and, you know, that, that you're protected if, they, you know, there may be things like that you don't want them to talk about in public or, you know, you don't want them to like steal your stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, there's, um, you know, here's my take on contracts. As somebody who's been doing this for a really long time, most things don't end up in court, right? Mm -hmm. Generally, things end up in court when there's a lot of money invested and you don't make any, or somebody makes a lot of money, you know, something makes a lot of money and then everybody wants to go argue about it. The vast majority of contracts that are out there in the world are there to create better relationships. Mm -hmm. That's really what it's about is, um, is creating a better relationship and you do that by being on the same page before it gets before it gets started. Everybody knows what's expected of them, what their obligations are, what they get if they if they complete that, et cetera. That builds better relationships. And that's how you grow businesses, right? By creating better relationships. And so even the word, even the phrase on the same page comes from just that, right? People being people reading the same document at the same time. Yeah. I love that because that's definitely been my experience in my business, you know, starting out, maybe we hadn't hammered things out very clearly with some, you know, of my contractors and I've been shoring up a lot of that this year. And I think it's just, it's, it's like when you're, you know, when you have an expectation of your children, but you don't, you I shouldn't use children as an example. It's not like my contractors yeah. are children, but you know, I'm a mom. So I'm thinking of this, like, if I don't like tell my kid, like, what do I expect when I say clean your room, you know, then they're, they're going to come out with something that they think is clean. And I'm going to be like, uh, no, this is not clean. So it's, it's also to just make sure that they understand, like, this is what I expect the job is and that they know that, you know, they're not going to come back later and say, well, I thought it was this, or I thought it was that. And just having that sense of security on their side as a contractor, I've found has made the relationship and the working together so much easier as well. So I, I think you're absolutely right. And, and people sometimes think that like doing a contract is going to make the relationship like strained and more uncomfortable, but I've found that it actually does make it better. Yeah. It's the, op it, it's the opposite. People are so afraid of contracts, right? They shouldn't be afraid of contracts. They should be afraid when there isn't one mm. or somebody refuses to sign one. If somebody refuses to sign one and, you know, especially in these collaboration situations, you should really think twice about working with that person. Mm. Yeah. It, it's a good benchmark of how somebody is going to be in the relationship itself. It's funny because people are, uh, you know, for years, I ran a law firm as well for many years and that's a business just like any other business. And people would say, you know, they're, they're going to hate sending me their contract, you know, whether it was a vendor or whatever, they're going to hate sending me their contract. And I'm as easy as it gets when, when somebody sends me a contract, like I have no interest in, in negotiating it, you know, heavily. I just want to see what, it, what are the rights and obligations? How long is it going to last? And, you know, what's the compensation on it? And I do very little negotiating, so to speak, in a, in a contract. I like, that's why I like templates. I am trying to get a sense of what, what is this other party going to be, uh, going to be like. 
hire a software development team, it's the exact same thing, right? What are you supposed to do? How long is this going to last? How, how, how much is this going to cost? And who owns it at the end of the day, mm -hmm. right? All of these things are about who owns it at the end of the day. One of the things that's so important for, for musicians is the whole concept of work for hire is at the end of the session, you're creating a piece of music. You're creating a, a piece of art and that art has ownership rights to it. Who can go ahead and get a copyright to it? Who has the right to exploit it? Who has the right to sell it? Who has the right to license it, etc.? If there's no work for hire contract between the collaborators, between anybody who touches it, so to speak, then they will have a right to a portion of that copyright. So if you are a if you're a singer songwriter, if you are if if you're the musician and you want it under your name and you want total ownership, you must have a contract with anybody who touches it. Mm -hmm. in the in the creation of it or they will have rights to the copyright and that's just the the, the very very basics right um so and it's and copyright is the right to copy and the right to make more and the right to exploit it so you want to have all of that copyright together right which is why having a contract with your studio is so important or or yes. your individual that's recording you because they have your files Yes. Right? Yep. Yep. <laughs> so I, I've seen this with a lot of students. Um, but, you know, it's interesting that you say it that way, because I think most musicians wouldn't ever think of it like that. They think of it like I have the right to it because it's mine. I created it. I came up with it, blah, blah, blah. And they're thinking about it from the songwriter perspective. Right. Versus the perspective of the recording, the master recording, where it's like, yes, these people did create this. Yes. You paid them, but they did create it. And if you don't draw this line that it's interesting that you say, like, they have they kind of have the right to it unless you make it clear that they don't. Yeah, it it even goes further than that. So joint copyright holding in, in music, especially well, for anything, if you are the co-owner of a copyright, you have the right to license it. You may not have the right to license it exclusively to somebody else, but you have the right to license the music to somebody without the consent of the of the other copyright holder. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if you own the copyright with somebody, unless it's in writing that they can only license it jointly, and then all you become is the right to receive money from that license as the other person. You have no you have no say in it. You can your your partner, so to speak, can go out and license it to, you know, commercials or to whatever they want. And you say, well, no, I wanted to protect the integrity of it. I don't want it in a, you know, in a, some car commercial. And you have no right to to argue that. So they're really these some of these things are just incredibly important um, for what they call, you know, the chain of title. Mm. Right. Is the and we talk about this a lot in entertainment laws, the chain of title of things is you've got to have every I dotted and T crossed to make sure that you've got a solid chain of title. So if a studio comes along and, and wants to buy the album from you to distribute the album, if you don't have all of these things, they won't do it unless it's some massive, massive bestseller. Um, because they do not want to spend the time and energy and money to go out and clear up all these rights on your behalf. So let's say you you get all this stuff in order, you've got everything in order with your collaborators, and then you get a publishing company that's interested and they want to represent your song. Them getting on board, is that just adding to the chain of title? Like how do you how do you speak about that? Well, they're gonna to wanna to see it. They're gonna to wanna to see that chain of title. Before right. But then when they become a publisher of the song, then are right. they, they basically, you know, they have then rights in there as Correct. well. There's new, there's new rights being created from that. Okay. Right? So it's sort of a ball of, you know, the ball of the chain of title and they're coming along after like them. Growing. Got it. Yes, okay. Exactly. Right. Interesting. Okay. Well, let's talk about sync because that's such a big, exciting topic for my audience, especially now with the indie world and so much, so much content being created that needs music. Right. Yeah. So 
having all of your contracts all in order and everything is going to help you get placements for sure. And as far as sync licensing, do you have the actual contracts? Like if say I wanted to license my song to someone else, do you have contracts in there? Yeah, we that have you music sync in here. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we do. And we've actually got them from the musician perspective in the music category. And then we've got them from like the filmmaker and video maker mm -hmm. perspectives um, in their categories. Got it. Yeah. So interesting. So like if I wanted to, let's just say I wanted to do a direct license or something to somebody who's creating some, you know, short film or something like that, I could get a contract for that. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Easy to do. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Now, are there any other kinds of contracts for musicians that we haven't talked about yet that you guys offer? There's, I think one of the things that we do have in there is sort of a splits, um, a uh, split agreement. So musicians can go in, just do, do a quick, you know, royalty splits as well in there. And um, we, we are working on it. It's not in there yet, but basically band partnership agreements and things like that are, mm. are, are coming down the pike. It's a little bit more difficult in the way that we built the system to do sort of these lar larger um, numbers, right? For, um, for, you know, if the band is more than a few people. So we were working on those. Uh, we're working on those as well. Makes sense. Now say we need to give somebody these contracts to prove that we have this chain of title. How do you guys, like what kind of sharing options are there? Do they then download them as a PDF or are they able to like send a view only copy? To yeah, you, they, they could just, you know, click it and um, once a contract is completed, they can just forward it to whoever you want. Mm, wow. Yeah. So, yeah, we thought of that because we knew that this stuff gets reviewed by other people quite often. So, and we are working on things like, you know, because our project briefcase is really designed to be by project itself. So um, we, we are working on the ability to sort of zip a file that's just one project. So if, um, you know, you, you have your podcast uh, in there as well as different albums, but you, you're going to, you know, your podcast gets picked up for distribution and somebody wants to see all the contracts, you can just forward them all at once. That's very cool. I love that. That can be really useful for, for sync licensing for sure. Or music libraries and things like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So love it. Okay. Well, anything else that you want to tell indie musicians about why they should really not ignore the legal side? Because too much stuff gets shelved and you, you can't bring it out unless you've got these things done properly. And that's a really important piece that I think that a lot of people ignore is uh, that if they don't get contracts done, there's stuff that can sit on the shelf. I'll, you know, one of the examples is I represented an extreme athlete um, for a lot of years and they did a ton of footage. And I mean, dozens and dozens and dozens of hours of footage of, of various uh, footage that they had done. And somebody came along and said, hey, we want to buy this footage. We want to license this footage and put it into, you know, bars will play the extreme skiing and all that kind of stuff. Right. They mm. sort of loop this stuff and they wanted to license it for a decent amount of money. And one of the camera people who was involved had never signed uh, off on a work for hire. And while they were trying to get it signed, he died in a wingsuit accident. Oh, no. And so then it was like that. Then all of a sudden there's somebody else who's, you know, you got to track down the heirs. And people who aren't necessarily in the business immediately just see dollar signs. Mm -hmm. right? And so it never got signed. The stuff sits on the shelf. Sad. And so what, what I always say to people is, is, is make sure you've got this stuff because you never know what's going to happen to it, right? You yeah. never know what's going to happen. And, what, and the last thing you want is it to be s sitting in a dark room, so to speak. That's right. I mean, you put so much of your creativity and your blood, sweat and tears and all of that stuff and, and money <laughs> into creating yeah. this stuff and you don't want it to be stuck in limbo. Yeah. And it happens all the time, especially in film. It happens all the time where oh, your stuff is stuck in limbo. Scripts, development, you know, where where nobody really understands what the rights are on something, so they just say, "Forget it." You know, it'll never come out. 
That's such a bummer. I hate yeah. that. I hate, I hate the studios that. are, yeah, the studios are filled with thousands of titles that they can't do anything with. Wow. Yeah. So. Well, this has been really enlightening. Um, I hope it's really, you know, encouraged our listeners to go take some action. I know you mentioned the Bree 75, B-R-E-E 75 as a coupon for my listeners. Where do they go to get access to Creators Legal? Creatorslegal.com. It's pretty simple. Yeah. They, and Bree 75 is 75% off the annual subscription. Wow. And so that's, you know, I think it's like 90, like I said, $96 or something like that for the annual. And so it's really easily accessible. Creatorslegal.com. We'd love it if you came and checked us out and tell us the things that you're looking for that we may not have as well. So we can make sure that we really create create the central place for creators to come. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. I love that about, you know, newer services. They're always looking to get input from people to, to really build it out, to be exactly what they need. So thank you for doing that. And thank you so much for sharing all this knowledge with us today. And I hope it prompts our listeners to take some action on the legal side. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It was great. Thanks for listening to the profitable musician show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.